So we can start for the next presentation. So I want to introduce Robert Young. He is an NMR expert at AMSU at PNNL. And now he will talk about NMR-based metabolomics research and how we can do this here for the synthetic biology or in general. Robert, it's your turn. Right. Thank you. All right, so. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's not like I've talked to start off a brief history, uh, do some basic theory experiments, uh, get into the workflow, databases and profiling approaches. I'll show a quick example of, of how we profile here, uh, typically at EMSL uh, using the a uh sample that was showcased in the first uh, talk. And then I'll um, finish with some highlights of select applications from the literature that, that showcase the strengths of OMAR. So nuclear magnetic resonance was first detected in molecular beings by Isabel Rabi in 1938, and he received the Nobel Prize for that in 2004. Uh, the first NMR of liquids and solids uh, was performed by the research groups of Edward Purcell and Felix Bloch, and they did so independently uh, in, 19, in the same year, 1946, and both shared the uh, Nobel Prize in 1952. That was the same year, the first commercial NMR spectrometer in the market. Uh, now, <clears throat> the first application of NMR to study metabolism is credited to uh, Wilson et al., who were studying ethanol metabolism in rats by carbon-13 isotope tracer studies. The field has grown since, and even though uh, for, for many years, the, the number of publications kind of hovered at a low level, as you can see, the century metabolomics research involving NMR is really taking off and, and showing no signs of slowing. And that's thanks in part to a lot of advances in techniques and instrumentation uh, that have come out since. So some of the strengths and weaknesses of NMR-based metabolomics, uh, its key strengths include that it's a high, highly reproducible method. There's, uh, no real batch effects <clears throat> associated with it. It's inherently quantitative. Uh, it often uh, requires minimal sample prep and no chemical derivatization. Uh, it's non-destructive. It's information rich. We use it to do uh, de novo 3D structure eluc elucidation of the molecule. Uh, and it's amenable to automated workflows. Some of its weaknesses, uh, the biggest one is it's relatively less sensitive than other techniques. Um, it's, it's about 10 to 100 times uh, less sensitive than mass spec, for example. Also, in terms of identifying metabolites, NMR spectral libraries are much less uh, extensive than those in mass spec. Plus, some things that complicate identifications include pH, ionic strength, temperature, and other matrix effects because they can cause certain things to shift. And if, if your, your sample contains um, many, many metabolites, uh, in a one spectrum that can, that can uh, cause a lot of signal overlap and, and again, complicate analysis. So what is NMR? So NMR technically um, capitalizes on the properties uh, that certain nuclei possess. Um, that is a magnetic moment that's um, due to circulating nuclear charge. Not all, um, not all nuclei are NMR active, uh, but every element on the periodic table uh, except cerium uh, has at least one NMR active isotope. NMR active doesn't necessarily mean NMR convenient or really feasible uh, to study, uh, but fortunately, uh, many of uh, the ones that we, we uh, like to interrogate in metabolomics are, are represented by receptive nuclei uh, for, for um, hydrogen, hydrogen one, or the proton, and carbon, nitrogen, and um, chlorine, and phosphorus all have uh, um, NMR active isotopes that have to be spin one half, uh, which is the easiest case. So what happens in NMR with these magnetic moments is if you put this in a strong external magnetic field, they'll experience a torque and begin to precess at a characteristic frequency. And it depends on this constant here, which is isotope specific. And so it's different for every NMR active uh, nuclei. Additionally, uh, the otherwise degenerate spin states <clears throat> uh, for these nuclei uh, is, is split when, when it gets put in a strong magnetic field, and it depends on the orientation of these uh, magnetic moments uh, in the field. Now, this energy difference is really, really small. And so that 
an ensemble uh, of, of nuclei uh, in these magnetic fields. The, the actual population, the number of <clears throat> nuclei with um, that, that are in the lower energy state is, is quite small. And the sensitivity of the NMR experiment is actually proportional to this population difference. And this is why it's, it's um, one of the least sensitive techniques relative to others. Uh, also, uh, since we can't change fundamental physical constants, um, as you can see here, <clears throat> we can increase this, this energy gap by increasing magnetic field strengths. And so there's always a push <clears throat> to keep going up in magnetic field. Now, uh, for our purpose, uh, the proton is the most sensitive stable isotope. It's 100% abundant and it's everywhere. Um, and I've listed <clears throat> some select parameters of spin one half nuclei that are, that are relevant to our research. And, and also wanted to highlight the fact too that when you hear people refer to their uh, NMR spectrometers <clears throat> and you hear them call out 500, 600, 800, uh, they're referring to the long more frequency of the proton uh, at a particular field as opposed to just calling it out in, in terms of Tesla or Gauss. And so in the simplest NMR experiment, the 1D pulse nuclear experiment, um, we can imagine these, these nuclear spins, this ensemble of nuclear spins, they're all precessing at the more, more frequency. And um, their magnetic moments are randomly oriented, but if you were to add up the, the component that's in line uh, with, with the field, uh, what you would get is a net magnetization uh, that's in line with it, corresponding to the, those in the lower energy state. To probe NMR, what we do is we, we apply a radio frequency pulse that's resonant um, with these nuclei. And so we're, we're talking about that low more frequency range. We apply this field 90 degrees to the static field, which causes all these spins now to precess about that field. So they absorb the energy, they go through transitions, and now what we have is this net magnetization vector um, transverse or 90 degrees to the applied field. And these spins are also now all um, precessing around that field and so they're coherent. Then that pulse goes off and they begin to precess around uh, the B0 field again. Now we have detection coils set up. And so these spinning magnets uh, induce a current into these detection coils. And we pick up a signal. Uh, amp oscillating amplitude versus time that corresponds to all these frequencies. Uh, this, this signal decays because relaxation processes cause that phase coherence to be lost over time. And the spins return that energy back to the surroundings and return to the state before we pulse. Um, now in practice, what we do is we wait until a significant uh, portion of that magnetization has returned. We repeat the experiment. <clears throat> and then we add the results to increase sensitivity. And those are called, each time we do that, it's called transient. Uh, some people still call them scans. We use a Fourier transform to um, convert this time domain signal into a spectrum uh, at the frequencies of all the constituent nuclei in there. Now, um, yeah. I'm sorry. To, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, but it seems like your audio seems a little bit quiet. Um, some people are having a hard time hearing you. By chance, do you have a nut like a headset or something else you can use as a microphone? I do not. <clears throat> I do not have a headset. I'll try and move this a little closer. Um, I don't know if that helps. Yeah, it still seems a little bit quiet. Um, I guess one other option. Do you happen to have a, a cell phone nearby that you could could join for audio? I do have a cell phone. Okay, yeah, it'll just just take a minute. So if you go to where you can mute and unmute in Zoom and click the little up arrow, there is a switch to phone audio option. And it'll just give you a phone number to call and then prompt you to enter that meeting ID and your participant ID, and then we should be able to hear you a little better. Okay. Yeah, I'm really sorry about this. Uh, I, th I thought in the testing, the, the volume was coming through. Yep, yeah, no problem. <clears throat> 
Okay, how, how, how am I coming through now? Okay, uh, I can hear you good. And it sounds like there might have been a little feedback earlier and I think that that might be uh, solved now. So I think you're good to go. Okay, well, let, let me know if, if I get quiet again and uh, we'll go to plan B. <clears throat> All right, so I'm not exactly sure where I left off. Um, I think uh, what I wanted to say was, <clears throat> If all these spins only precess at the Barmore frequency, NMR would be very interesting. But the fact is they um, actually experience slightly different fields um, based on their location in molecules due to the electron density um, because these magnetic fields induce, uh, they get the electrons circulating and moving charges make magnetic fields. And these fields, they can either uh, reinforce uh, the, the static field and that's called deshielding or they can, they can counter it. Uh, and we call that shield um, shielding, and these cause the um, the uh, the frequencies to change based on um, its location in, in a molecule. Now, the transformed NMR spectrum will, will contain all these different frequencies, and because nobody has a magnet with the exact same frequency to the level of precision that would be needed uh, for direct comparison, we normalize these frequencies to the chemical shift scale, and so. Uh, we always use a, a, a frequency uh, of a reference peak and, and, the, and the peak of interest. Now, this is a small uh, separation. It's kilohertz at max. And of course, the frequency, the lower more frequencies we're talking about are megahertz range. And so this is a, a parts per million. Um, these are parts per million differences. And that's the origin of the chemical shift scale. having trouble advancing that slide. Um, and so, like I said, it's, it's really, you know, the, the, these nuclear, uh, these nuclei, these NMR active nuclei are excellent reporters on the local um, chemical structure. And here I'm showing the, the chemical shift ranges for the proton. It has a relatively narrow chemical shift range. It's a first row element, not a lot of electron density around it. Um, but as you can see, we, we get separation and we're able to characterize the environments based on, on, the, on the ranges they, they typically occupy here. Uh, now, carbon-13, um, carbon the NMR active isotope of carbon, it, it has a much wider uh, chemical shift range, um, second row element, more electron density around that, and it's much more sensitive to this. <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, it's not a very uh, receptive uh, nuclei compared to the proton, so we tend not to measure it directly in most uh, NMR metabolomics. But there are indirect ways to get it at natural abundance. Uh, get its information. And so I also want to point out that uh, mo most uh, metabolomic studies uh, are carried out in aqueous environments in the solution state, that is. And uh, we, we typically won't see the acidic or alcoholic or amine type protons. Um, so, so our chemical shift range is a little tighter. And um, that, that's because these, these trade with water, with the solvent. And uh, we also have to actively suppress the signal from water, because as you can imagine, um, it, it's uh, quite large. So to illustrate some of the properties, the sensitivities of, of these protons to their environment, uh, I thought I would um, make a simple example with some alcohols, uh, the first three alcohols in solution, and uh, discuss some of what we see in an MR spectrum. And so for the simplest one, methanol, we see a single peak corresponding to these methyl protons. It sits a little past uh, around 3.3 relative to the reference. In moving up to the next higher alcohol, we see a dramatic shift of that methyl peak to a lower chemical shift value. Um, it's, it's more shielded now that it's not, these protons are not attached to a carbon that's directly attached to the electronegative oxygen. We also begin to see some fine structure uh, that I'll talk more about on the next slide. Moving up again, extending that chain, we see another shift to a more shielded position. This one's not as dramatic um, as the first. And we also see, again, more splitting patterns. Uh, this fine structure is very important in NMR. Uh, <clears throat> and then finally, moving up to the isomer of propanol, um, we, we, we're back down to two signals, and that's because these methyl protons, they have to, on average, experience the exact same environment. and so. Uh, they contribute to one signal, which is split, the spline structure, uh, and the methine uh, is up here um, with the highest uh, e shield value in this, in this spectrum. Uh, and so, as you can see now, as we move up to more uh, complicated molecules, 
the features you have to identify a molecule uh, become more. We go from one, a single peak to not just two peaks and two chemical shifts, but also um, the splitting, this fine structure. And, and as you can see, these uh, isopropanol and propanol, they're isomers, uh, they have the exact same match, yet in NMR, their spectra are um, quite easy to tell apart. So that splitting we saw uh, is called J-coupling, and it's um, basically this this proton-proton coupling, or, or the coupling that we're seeing here between protons is transmitted through bonds. Uh, I'll spare the details on the origins of that, uh, but these these splittings uh, also report on the number of neighboring protons um, by this n plus one rule, and the peak separations this coupling in Hertz uh, is not magnetic field dependent too, and so as we move to different fields, this will remain a constant. Um, one more thing I just want to point out is these, these simple patterns uh, get more complicated. If, say, for example, these um, protons on the CH2, if there's some kind of bond, um, if there's kind of restriction and bond rotation and things like that where they don't sense the same uh, environment on average, they'll, th that'll lead to more um, complicated splitting patterns. Um, and so once again, when we look at an NMR spectrum, in this uh, example, ethanol, we have two chemical shifts. And then we have these characteristic J coupling values that are going to be the same between them. We also see J coupling to other NMR active nuclei. It's a little harder to spot in a natural abundance uh, spectrum because carbon's only um, uh, has only carbon 13 is only 1.1% natural abundant. But if we have a, a sufficiently intense peak in the spectrum, we can we can see these. Uh, and so I want to show you this example of uh, carbon 13 we call satellites uh, in, in acetate. So when, when we have splitting due to a, a another atom, uh, we call them satellites. And as you can see, if, if we, the, I, I've had to clip vertically the, the main peak for the, carb, the carbon-12 acetate. But as we go down towards the bottom of the peak, we can see uh, uh, this splitting here, which is a two-bond uh, J-coupling between carbon and hydrogen. And it's being split by this neighboring atom having uh, carbon-13. And if these protons are directly attached to a carbon, that, that's uh, carbon-13, um, they split even more with these characteristic uh, values. And so these are not only diagnostic and indicate the, um, the, the coupling, but we can also integrate these peak areas and they'll report, um, in this case, natural abundance. And so if you think about carbon-13 isotope tracer studies, these proportions would change if something became labeled. And so we can, in one peak here, in this case, uh, in methanol, uh, not only get information about the directly bound carbon, but also neighboring um, carbons as well. And so it's site-specific labeling. Uh, so talking about uh, integrating peaks, so um, NMR is inherently quantitative. And what that means is that the integrated areas of these peaks, and I want to stress integrated areas, it's not uh, simply peak heights, it's actually integrating uh, the full area of these multiplets uh, is directly related to the number of nuclei that contribute to it. Um, and, and so if we, if we look at ethanol in this example, if, if I integrate these peak areas here and here, uh, the ratio of those will be two to three. And so this is adding yet another uh, layer of information. So we have chemical shift, we have J coupling, coupling, and we have ratios of protons. Um, consistent within a molecule. Now, in a mixture where the concentrations vary, if we have a calibrant that's added at a known concentration, and of course we know the number of protons it has, uh, we can calculate the concentration of uh, any other uh, metabolite we identify in the solution. Now, the spectra that I've shown so far are, are pretty simple single molecules, uh, or yeah, single molecules in water. In a real spectrum, uh, we can have thousands of peaks from hundreds of compounds. Uh, this, this complicates identification and, and quantitation, um, but we do have tools to get, get around that and, and we can disperse these signals uh, from a 1D into multiple, multiple dimensions by adding pulses to our sequence and putting incremented delays. Um, um, yeah, we, we, we can get more um, chemical shift disbursement and more information from these. And so they, they take longer. And so they're not generally measured for, for every sample in a metabolomics analysis. You might 
selectively choose some or pull samples. Uh, also, you lose some quantitative accuracy in these 2D experiments. Um, higher dimensional, uh, higher dimension experiments are also possible, but when you get into those, you really have to um, consider labeling. So I want to show some common 2D experiments that are uh, used quite often in MR and show you some of the information we can get from it. Um, because we use these to do structure elucidation. And so, of, of course, these are good to identify uh, molecules in, in complex mixtures, especially if we already know where the chemical shifts are going to be or should be. Uh, so the homonuclear case, uh, I'm showing what's called a total correlation uh, spectros spectroscopy spectrum. Um, the diagonal axis, since this is a um, homonuclear, it's, it's essentially this, this 1D spectrum that I have projected on the top. And what these off-diagonal peaks uh, report on is for a particular chemical shift, it's telling you all the neighboring protons in a chain of J-coupled nuclei. And so even though this doesn't J-couple directly to this, it does to this. And so you can go down a broken chain of J-coupling and map out uh, what we call spin systems. And these are um, very diagnostic and, and used uh, to identify um, unknowns or to make or to confirm ideas of uh, other metabolites in, in complex mixtures. We can also do heteronuclear two-dimensional experiments. Uh, the one I'm showing here is called the HSQC. And what this one does is it correlates a particular proton chemical shift to the chemical shift of the carbon that it's directly bound to. And so now we have the even further chemical shift dispersion uh, because of carbon 13's wider chemical shift range. And so, um, as you can see, we, we get a, a nice spread of signals. Also, capitalizing on those J-couplings, uh, again, we can actually phase peaks in the spectrum to tell us whether the uh, pH correlation has an even number or an odd number of protons attached to it. And so that can be very helpful when you get in areas where there can be some ambiguity and you're trying to make an assignment. And so what about carbons that don't have a proton bound? There are experiments we can do to get at those as well. Um, this one's called the heteronuclear multiple bond correlation experiment. And what it does is it correlates the chemical shift of a proton, not with the directly bound carbon, but with the neighboring carbons two, three, and even sometimes four bonds away. And as you can see, it will pick up the chemical shift of quaternary carbons. And then in the schematic, I moved down here just to show that you can continue to go down the chain and, and um, you can begin to see how this is a, a useful way to construct molecules uh, from these characteristic chemical shifts and correlations. So now that we have an idea of what NMR is and, and some of the things that we can do with it, um, I'm going to discuss a little bit about the uh, typical workflows. Now, in metabolomics, the most common experiment is the 1D proton experiment, and that's because it's, it's a very sensitive nucleus. It's everywhere. The experiments are fast. And no matter what other analysis you might do, you're going to start here. Um, but regardless, in any study, the, uh, the sequence of events is, is much like um, any other analysis, except for there's differences when it comes to the sample prep um, as to what's necessary. Uh, and then we have to get it on the instrument, acquire the data, get the signal uh, into a form that, that's easier for us to interpret, and then decide how. Um, we're going to go about analyzing it. So on the topic of sample preparation, NMR is quite tolerant of wide-ranging sample conditions, uh, can handle um, low and high pHs and even high salt uh, situations. Uh, a lot of times, sample prep can be as simple as filtering a solution or adding a biocide and, and a calibrant um, in, in a small amount of D2O or deuterated water if we're um, in aqueous solvents, which you are a lot. I'll say something about that later uh, when I get to the instrument setup. Uh, we don't need to do prior separations of aqueous samples. There's no need for chemical derivatization. And if we're working with tissues or extracts, um, you know, the, the common techniques like MPLEX, we can, we can take those samples and uh, use those in solution state NMR, and, and we do that quite often as well. Uh, these are um, pictured here are some sample tubes that we uh, measure that we use to measure NMR. And they're typically three or five millimeters and volumes are around 150 to 600 microliters, but there are specialty um, 
probes and specialty tubes for ultra low volumes and especially salty samples. And so we're not limited to this. Now, I want to mention something about uh, a particular strength in not having to do extensive sample pr preparation uh, by showing you an example from a study I'm currently involved in where, where it's an eco-metabolomic study. We're studying met methanogenic bacteria in, in um, sediments. And so we get these pore waters by taking wet sediment, centrifuging it, and pulling it off the top. Uh, we can take that directly, add a calibrant, put it, put it in an NMR, NMR tube and measure it. Um, and then if we want to get uh, more identifications and we need to concentrate, because as you can see, uh, these, these two are, are on the same scale, same gain. And so th this is their real relative uh, intensities. Uh, here I've exploded the scale so we can see some of these metabolites like ethanol and acetate and acetone. Uh, so we, we can screen these samples pretty much as is and get this information. And if we need to, we can, we can go ahead and concentrate later. And uh, in this particular case, uh, when, whenever you do stuff that dry down, you're going to alter the concentrations of low molecular weight alcohols uh, or acetate. And th if their concentrations aren't altered significantly, they, they can end up being undetectable, especially for like acetone and ethanol. And so we're, we're able to screen samples and send them through uh, additional processing steps because NMR is non-destructive. And so um, we, can, we can send it down other pipelines or do the screening. Like I said, if you've ever had an MRI, then you were the sample in an NMR experiment. And so uh, the, the technique itself didn't hurt, but, but the bill might have. So getting it on the instrument, how do we generate such high magnetic fields? Well, they do that by uh, putting a, a high current into a, into a superconducting coil. And this coil only superconducts at very cold temperatures. And so this sits in a bath of liquid helium and surrounded by a vacuum space. Uh, and that vacuum space is surrounded by a bath of liquid nitrogen, which is surrounded by another vacuum space. And so you can see if, if you've ever walked uh, on the floor of an NMR instrument lab, the reason these instruments are so large is because they're, they're big thermoses. Um, now the probe that the sample goes in is usually inserted in the bore of the magnet and it holds the sample at the strongest part of the static field. And it has coils to transmit and receive the radio frequency signals that are generated in the hardware over here. Now, the signals that we're reading back from the sample are extremely weak and so that they have to be amplified. And you wanna do that before thermal noise can accumulate. So you're not amplifying that too. And so the amplifier is usually located close to the probe. In practice today, uh, we, we use what are known as cryoprobes. And what this does is it keeps the detection circuitry, the coil, and the preamplifier are housed in here together and they're kept at cryogenic temperatures. And so um, doing that, we boost signals noise uh, by three to four times and that amounts to uh, a huge improvement in sensitivity and it cuts down on experiment times as well. So when it comes to setups, I've, I've listed some, some things that, that we need to do to get things going. Uh, with the modern hardware, modern software today, uh, routines to automate these steps are very, very robust. So a lot of times it's a matter of just entering your metadata, deciding which experiments you want to run, and, and hitting go. Uh, since I did mention that D2O earlier, um, that's for the lock. Basically, um, the instrument has a separate channel that monitors the signal of deuterium, which is also NMR active, of course. Um, it does not interfere with our detection on the proton. But what it does is it monitors that um, because it's, um, sensitive to changes um, in the magnetic field, or so very small drifts in the static magnetic field. Uh, these are in a feedback loop, and so they'll put currents through a field coil to basically keep the magnet locked at, at, at field, because if it drifts, then your lines are going to spread out. And so that, that's what that's for. Acquisition times, it really depends on your sample. If, if you have decent concentrations, it can only take a few minutes. Um, but as you saw in that pore water sample that I showed earlier, uh, the one before lapelization, we might measure one of those for a couple hours. Uh, 2D experiments, you can count on them always taking longer than the corresponding 1D, um, but in decent samples, even a 2D experiment, it, there's um, especially homonuclear ones, they can be quite fast. Uh, but then again, uh, these can also extend to several hours or the better part of a day. It, like I said, it, all, it always um, depends. 
So once the signal is acquired, we need to do some things to, to um, convert it into a form that uh, is more interpretable by us. And so I've listed some steps that we do to do that. I think some of these steps will be highlighted in more detail later today during the data analysis or data processing um, talk. So when it comes to approaches to NMR data analysis, um, like many of the other approaches that have been uh, presented, we have untargeted approaches or targeted approaches. And so in an untargeted approach, uh, you, would, you would basically divide that, that spectrum of chemical shifts into various regions and perform statistical analysis to see where, where significant changes in particular regions are occurring. And that's opposed to targeted analysis where you'd be identifying individual met metabolites and their concentrations and then performing analysis on that. And so in the global profiling or untargeted approach, um, there, there's some additional processing steps that, that you would need to take and decisions have to be made about how you're going to align spectra and binning. Uh, these are not uh, trivial choices and there's many approaches to them. And so I just want to point that out. It's, it's uh, not, it's, it's not a, always a simple and straightforward um, decision process on how you're going to uh, um, form that binning. Uh, these are best suited for high throughput analysis where you have studies where you have hundreds of samples, uh, lots of data coming through, and critically, where you have good control over sample preparation and measurement conditions because uh, what you don't want to be picking up are differences in sample prep, but differences in whatever the uh, whatever the biology is, whether it's disease versus control or depth in an eco-metabolomic study. Um, and so, uh, of course, these are, are, we see a lot of, of use in these in biomarker identification and, and medical metabolomics. Target analysis, on the other hand, seeks to identify and quantify metabolites from a predetermined list, uh, and these would have existing spectral entries. Uh, in the previous talk, we mentioned that you know this is through a hypothesis-driven approach. In practice, most of the analysis we do on smaller scale studies where the statistical methods um, in, the, in the binning approaches aren't as robust, uh, maybe because number one, we don't have the number of samples or we don't have the control uh, over the sample condition, we do an untargeted analysis that looks very much like the targeted analysis, except we extend this to trying uh, to identify all the features in the spectrum after exhausting our database search. Um, this is actually uh, the most common approach uh, we use here. Very rarely um, are, are we only interested in a select list and, and not anything else. So when it comes to the databases, um, this is an, a weakness of NMR. The databases uh, that we use to identify compounds are much less populated than those for MS, and, and I mean much, much less. And so I was, I was trying to get a hard number on the number of unique spectra. And when I say uh, of, of different metabolites, I mean standards. Uh, there's certainly at least 800, could be 2,400. Uh, it depends on how to count. And I'm not sure if some are being double counted. Uh, there are some open access and more spectral libraries for metabolomics. There's actually quite a few. Some of the most popular ones are the HMDB uh, or the BMRB, but like I said, there are more. These databases usually have some limited spectral search uh, feature or function. Um, and then others have, uh, like Colmar, um, they, they have uh, quite robust and extensive uh, search functions for 1D and 2D data. And I'll show you an example of Colmar, a Colmar search uh, coming up. And so automating steps um, in metabolite identification, uh, NMR is great for the high throughput uh, analysis data acquisition. When it comes to automating metabolite identification from spectral databases, um, in addition to the limitations uh, based on them not being as populated, uh, chemical shifts can be sensitive to pH, concentration, uh, and types of cations uh, when it comes to salt and temperature. Um, if you measure things at different fields, you'll see small adjustments, especially uh, where multiplets are concerned because they'll, they'll have slightly different chemical shift positions. Uh, those are predictable, but you still have to predict them uh, when you're approaching the analysis. And of course, signal uh, overlap in 1D spectra can make, make things complicated. Um, there are still several approaches that, that seek to automate or make semi-automated a lot of steps in the entire workflow from uh, study design all the way up to biological interpretation. 
of course, uh, the NMR side being um, focused on the acquisition uh, and processing, especially and the, the identification. Um, and these, you can custom tailor if, for example, you're looking at a specific biofluid like urine, uh, where the samples, you have a lot of control over the sample conditions and, um, and the, that sample similarity, you, you can make robust and automated tools uh, for targeted uh, analysis. Uh, the thing is, is they don't necessarily translate to other types uh, of biofluids or other types of studies. Uh, here at EMSL, we use a program uh, by Konomics. It's a commercial program, and it has a proprietary spectral database of three, 338 compounds, and these were measured at a variety of uh, fields, as well as um, a pretty significant range of pH, um, and, that, and that makes metabolite identification uh, a little easier. It uses a visual matter, uh, pattern matching approach to identify metabolites. And when you fit these visual patterns to the peaks, um, they're also calibrated so that um, when, when you get a peak fit, you're also getting uh, a calibrated concentration. Uh, you can also import databases like the HMDB and use those chemical shifts for additional metabolite identification, but those are not calibrated if it's outside their database. And so if you want to do quantification, you have to go offline and do some manual integration in those cases. Uh, so just to show you an example, um, a quick little example, uh, in line with the ACE to the tertius cells that were, were mentioned in the Agile Biofoundry, they asked us if we could measure some uh, NMR on some of their samples. And so we, we took a look at the intracellular metabolites that were extracted in MPLEX. And since these had been analyzed by GCMS, uh, we, they were interested to know if we could pick out the cis and trans isomers because the uh, GCMS couldn't discriminate uh, between those. Um, and so we measured the spectra. This, this is the spectrum here. Um, the signals are pretty low for these compounds, as I'll show you. Uh, so they're in the database. We have multiple features to make these identifications because these two isomers have very different chemical shifts for both of the, the protons and uh, proton regions. And so we go in. We match from the database the peak shapes. This one's a little obscured with overlap. And as you can see, the features, the shape here and the J coupling here um, fits quite nicely. And our residuals, this green line is the residual from the fit, is quite smooth too. And so we have confident identification. We also have quantification. And, and both, both of these happen to be in the, in the extract that we studied. Um, less than 10 micromolar, but still able to detect them uh, quite nicely. Uh, if we need to confirm, if we need to make confirmation, confirmations of low level um, metabolites like this, then we spike in a standard, uh, which, which I've shown here. And if we have more concentrated metabolites, we can make use of 2D NMR. And, and I show an example of this on this slide. So I took that same sample, I measured a 2D HSQC spectrum, so I'm getting proton and carbon chemical shifts correlations. Uh, Colmar has an online server. You can take your peak list and you can uh, put it through their program. They, they have a variety of 2D experiments that you can use in their analysis. And their database is actually up to 700 compounds right now. And so when you do this, you get a, you get a visual return on, on the peaks that, that showed up in your peak list and how many were assigned to a single compound or multiple compounds or to no compounds. And then you also get a, a chart talking about the uniqueness. So once again, NMR, you have multiple features to identify, uh, with the exception of those that only have one peak, you have multiple features uh, for, from which to make identifications. So you get uniqueness scores on how many match. And in this particular sample, we were able to um, go back into the, um, the Konomics program and in our 1D spectrum, uh, able to quantitate 11 of these 18 um, that were confirmed or 11 of 18 were confirmed in this case. And um, just with uh, additional untargeted profiling, we're able to come up with 29 more metabolites. And if, uh, if I spent more time on it, I could probably uh, make, make many more assignments too. So on my way out, it's, uh, actually with, with the delay, I'm not sure exactly how I'm doing on time, but I'm sure I'm probably almost out of it. Um, so 
I wanted to just showcase some articles uh, in metabolomics or, or omics research that have an, an, an NMR angle where, where NMR had a, a particular advantage uh, to the study. Um, and this first one that I'm showing here, um, just kind of showing the versatility of NMR, it was real time in organism, NMR metabolomics in, in a whole organism. So they took the elegans, these worms, they fed it carbon 13 enriched E. coli. And as you can see in here, they put the live worms in an, in a, in an NMR tube, added capillary with some D2O for that instrument lock, and measured 2D spectra. And from these, they were able to um, look at the changes in concentrations over time of several metabolites in their, in their TOC graphic, they just showed glucose, but there were other metabolites as well. And they were able to map out different glucose production pathways um, under different conditions where they knocked out these uh, catalytic subunits. And so um, this is a pretty cool application uh, of NMR and metabolomics, I think, uh, very, um, not, not a completely unique uh, as well. You'll find other examples of uh, whole organism, uh, real-time metabolomics. The next three articles that I wanted to highlight were uh, EMSL user projects. So the outside users um, submitted proposals to EMSL and um, my colleagues in, in these cases collaborated uh, and, and uh, produced some really interesting studies. This particular one uh, was looking at microbial interactions in hydrology fractured shells. And so the, these microbial uh, communities didn't exist there. They were inadvertently added there by the, by the process of fracking. And so these, these bacteria uh, under these enormous selective pressure of high salinity, uh, low oxygen, high pressure, um, seeing how uh, the, the strategies that they used to survive in this environment uh, made for a really, a really interesting study. And uh, as you can see in this network, um, certain metabolites were identified. Glycine betaine, um, for example, was uh, not only an osmoprotectant, it was also being used by this Helen bacteria as a, uh, for energy, um, but they were able to map out all these interactions and uh, NMR metabolomics um, played a key role in this. Um, one of the reasons it, it, it was so advantageous to use NMR is these hydraulically fractured shells, these produced fluids are extremely saline, they're hyper saline. And so um, you can imagine cleanup and these being quite a mess, but we, we have salt, salt tolerant cold probes um, and we were able to uh, measure these metabolites and, and help map these out. So um, NMR highly tolerant of, of quite, um, quite a wide range of conditions. This other one, uh, another one that my colleagues here at PNL collaborated on with outside users um, of, of you know, this one's you know, of, of a human interest, uh, looking at this autism spectrum disorder where they implanted microbiota from children um, who had autism spectrum disorder in mice. And then they saw um, behaviors that were uh, typical with the disorder in, in the mice, in the germ-free mice that they had implanted these in. Uh, when they looked and did metabolomic study of the clonic fluid and, and during, uh, using both GCMS and well, the GCMS was using the colon and the serum. They did NMR of the colonic fluids. Um, the thing I want to point out here is of 21 identifiable max metabolites that, that were significantly changing. Uh, only one was identified in common between both methods. And it turns out that two that, were, that had been um, cited as deficient in um, patients with ASD uh, were were used as a therapeutic in, in, in mice with, with autism, um, and they saw a reversal of behaviors. And so uh, one of these was taurine, which was only picked up in the NMR. And so the reason I wanna highlight this one is it shows the complementarity, complementarity of the techniques and how um, if you have access to both approaches, why, why not use it, increase your coverage and uh, pick up more things because they both have strengths and weaknesses. And on that, uh, the last one uh, I highlight, and I'll, I'll get DOIs uh, and, and links to all these, and put them on, um, and put them on the drive in the folder where where we can upload uh, upload those for for everyone. Um, but this one had to do with um, determining the structure of unknowns and combining the power of both mass spectrometry and NMR uh, as a filter. Um, so 
they would get a, a retention um, a retention time of peak and unknown, generate structures of all isomers, predict tandem MS and NMR spectra, and then uh, look at the experimental spectra to weed out all the uh, false positives on those. And so that's another interesting application um, that I'd like to point out. And so in conclusion, um, I just want to reiterate that NMR is a highly versatile tool. In metabolomics research, it's capable of, capable of providing expanded and complementary methods uh, for metabolite coverage with other orthogonal techniques. Although it's relatively less sensitive than other tools, it will report on the most abundant metabolites without any instrument method bias and is inherently quantitative. Its ability to tolerate wide-ranging conditions uh, and sometimes extreme sample conditions minimize sample handling losses or any biases that can be introduced by sample handling. And, and sometimes, as in the case of those hydro hydraulically fractured shell uh, produced fluids, sometimes it's the most accessible technique for a given problem. Um, and, and as we saw again, the fact that it's non-destructive permits multiple analysis on one sample and even in vivo metabolomics. Uh, and so it's also fully capable of providing very detailed treaty structural information and can be combined synergistically with mass spec for uh, the difficult task of deter determining uh, or identifying unknowns and complex mixtures. And so with that, I'll conclude and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Robert. Um, I think we are over time by two minutes. Uh, so maybe one question, then we break for... Um, so let me see which one. We have respond most of the questions, but there is new questions coming out on Discord right now. So there is like question from Andrew, like are there center, certain compounds that are better suited for NMR versus MS? Um, and he's just pointing that there's a lot of examples of organic acids. Um, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I was having trouble hearing you. Actually, uh, is that is that a question that's written in the chat that I could read? Yeah, it's on the Discord right now. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? Because uh, I'd have to open Discord. <laughs> He was questioning about what are uh, what type of compounds are, are better suited for MS or or NMR, and he also says there's a lot of example with organic acids. Um, you know, would the study looking at those type of molecules perhaps be better suited for NMR versus MS, or they're equal? So NMR is uh, some of uh, with, with NMR. What you see is what you get, and and there's no like instrument biases when it comes to detecting compounds, um, and so like we don't we don't have we don't have to rely on uh, a particular molecules reactivity um, to, to to be able to ionize um, if if it's in there and it's solution and if it's enough concentration sensitivity is really our limit, and so uh, if it's there in sufficient concentration we can detect it. Um, NMR is great for picking up, like I showed um, when we looked at those pore waters, because we don't have to do sample analysis. A lot of times we'll get those low molecular weight alcohols uh, or ketones and, and other, other molecules that would otherwise volatilize um, during other sample handling uh, steps. Okay, cool. Um, so I think we're five minutes over time. We have, we're supposed to have a 15 minutes break. So um i think we're gonna do a 10 minutes break and come back with uh this presentation there's uh more questions for you on discord robert if you can look at an answer there that would be great okay we'll do thank you all right okay so we'll be back at 11 30 10 minutes from now 